This online section is being presented for you by EMS University out of Tempe, Arizona. It includes new material published in the National EMS Education Standards in 2009 in response to the EMS Education Agenda for the Future. My name is Wendy Younger. I'm a paramedic educator for EMS University and I'll be presenting this program for you on infectious disease. As a frontline medical provider, a paramedic will be exposed to a wide variety of medical and trauma-related emergencies. And as such, you're going to be one of the first people exposed to contagious diseases. For your protection, the protection of your team members, and the safety and well-being of everyone involved or exposed to the patient, it's important to observe all precautions to prevent the spread of disease. By having a knowledge of prevalent disease processes, you can take steps to prevent the transmission of disease. We as healthcare professionals have a moral and ethical obligation to take precautions to protect ourselves, our families, our co-workers, and our patients from exposure to infectious or communicable diseases that we come in contact with while providing emergency care to the public. As a care provider, you must take precautions to take to protect everyone who comes in contact with a potentially contagious disease. Um, this is some of the legal information on infectious diseases. Um, 29 CFR 1910 which is an OSHA regulation, addresses the need for protection against infectious disease and what you and your employer is responsible for. Um, obviously, there are national concerns that regard uh, communicable diseases and infection control, and those concerns have resulted in public law, guidelines, standards, and recommendations to protect healthcare providers and emergency responders. The components of a healthcare agency's exposure control plan have to have the following. Okay, they have to have health maintenance and surveillance. They need to appoint a designated officer, an infection control officer, to serve as a liaison between your agency and, and the community health agencies that are involved in monitoring and responding to communicable diseases. They have to have identification of job classifications and, in some cases, specific tasks when exposure to a bloodborne pathogen is possible. A schedule that details when and how the provision of bloodborne pathogen standards will be implemented. They have to have properly sized PPE that's given to you without any charge. They need to go through body substance isolation training to you without, for, without any charge. There must be procedures in place Uh, procedures in place for evaluating exposure and post-exposure counseling. Uh, they need to be able to notify and work with local health authorities and state and federal agencies regarding exposures. Personal, building, vehicle, and equi equipment disinfection procedures and storage. There must be yearly training provided for you on infectious, uh, infectious diseases after action analysis of the type of action taken if there was an exposure. They must dispose of biohazardous waste properly. Uh, the, they also must provide correct handling of linen and supplies that become contaminated with body fluids during patient care. And they there must be identification of agency and or contracted personnel who will counsel, authorize acute medical care, and take care of documentation regarding an exposure. Your responsibilities, first of all, you have to familiarize yourself with laws, regulations, and the standards that regard infectious disease. Always, always use your PPE if you expect to be protected from bugs and treated for an exposure. 
And you basically don't have any legal recourse if you don't. You must attend that yearly training. You must wash your hands and keep your equipment clean and maintain your immunizations. You have to be aware of the potential consequences of the disease for public health and through contact with family members and friends. Okay? Uh, you have to have a proactive attitude toward infection control. You need to take care of your own personal hygiene and pre prevent offensive body odors. Pay attention to wounds and maintenance of your skin. Effective hand washing ev after every patient contact. Washing and disposing of, of your work garments before entering your home. Handling your uniforms in, a, in accordance with your agency's definition of PPE. Preparing food and eating in appropriate areas. Maintaining your, your basic general physiological and psychological health to prevent stress to you, which can compromise your immune system. Proper disposal of needles and sharps. Proper disposal of body fluid tinged linens and supplies. Awareness and avoidance of the tendency to wipe your face or rub your eyes, your nose, your mouth with gloved hands. And knowledge of the general classification of exposures to determine the extent of infection control um, measures that are applied to you as a health care provider. The Ryan White Act. Um, the Ryan White Act re requires medical facilities to release information as requested about patients who come in contact with and the infectious diseases that they have, including sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, hepatitis of any form, meningitis, tuberculosis, rubella, and other infectious diseases. This, this is a, a, an act that was passed in 1990. It was called the Ryan White Comprehensive AIDS Resources Emergency Act. And it absolutely requires notification to emergency responders if they've been exposed to infectious diseases. It also requires that employers name a department officer to direct communications between the hospital and the emergency service in case of an exposure. Notification must be made within 48 hours of determination of the presence of the disease. Now, the CDC has classified infectious diseases into two types, airborne and bloodborne. The, the primary airborne disease is infectious tuberculosis. The primary bloodborne diseases spread by pathogens are hepatitis B and C and HIV. The CDC also lists less common infectious diseases, and those include things like diphtheria, hemorrhagic fevers, uh, meningococcal disease, plague, and rabies. Currently, medical facilities aren't required to test patients for infectious diseases. But if you suspect a possible exposure, you can submit a written notice to the department officer. The DO, in turn, must submit a written request for determination to the medical facility that treated the patient for information. It has to review the results of diagnostic tests performed. It also has to review any signs and symptoms the patient may have that correspond to, that, to the CDC's list of infectious diseases. After determining whether you have been exposed to an infectious disease, they must notify the DO within 48 hours of receiving a request. Now that's not entirely true. Um, if you are exposed to an infectious disease, right there at the hospital, you can request to speak to an, to an infection control officer and explain the situation and request that action be taken on it. The results of, of those findings will be sent directly to you, not to a department officer. Okay, and, and that is um, for your own privacy. Okay. The agencies that are that deal primarily with, with uh, public health and well-being in terms of infectious diseases are the Public Health Service, the World Health Organization, 
and the Center for Disease Control. The complexity of the public health service is kind of difficult to define. Uh, they have a, a standard blurb on it, which is, it is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through community efforts for sanit sanitation of the environment, control of communicable disease, personal hygiene education, organization of medical and nursing services for the care, management, and prevention of disease, and development of the means to provide a standard of living adequate for health maintenance. And you just kind of have to think about the number and type of organizations that are involved in making that sort of thing possible. Public health service is pretty unique. It interacts with so many different organizations in an attempt to ensure a healthy population. And these are some of the functions that they do. But that's, this isn't all of them. Vaccination programs, motor vehicle safety, workplace safety, healthier mothers and babies, fluoridation of drinking water, infectious disease control. They claim that they have made a difference in the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease from education programs, safer and healthier foods, uh, as in hand washing and different sanitary practices, family planning and stop smoking programs. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about infectious diseases. Um, infectious disease is a disease-invading organism called a pathogen, such as a virus or bacteria or a parasite or, or whatever. A communicable disease is a disease that can be passed from person to person. Okay, tetanus is infectious, but not communicable. All right? And, and some diseases are both infectious and communicable. These are the ones that we're pretty much uh, concerned with. Um, in terms of what causes them, we have, we have viruses, okay? Viruses, scientists argue that, that a virus may not be a living organism at all. Uh, but it does get in there and do some bad stuff. It's the smallest living organism, okay? Uh, it can't replicate without a host. So, so uh, many of these little viruses can't even survive outside a host cell. But what happens is the virus gets into a cell and it replicates. And it replicates by becoming part of the cell's DNA. It's one of the reasons that it's very difficult to come up with antiviral medication. Because if you kill the virus, you kill the cell. Uh, some examples of viruses are HIV, hepatitis, polio, and influenza. And um, a couple of those are extremely contagious. Now, bacteria is a little bit different. Uh, bacteria causes diseases by attacking and digesting living cells or by the toxic byproducts that they secrete. Um, they, they can definitely survive outside a host. They can self-replicate without a host. They produce toxins that are sometimes more harmful than the bacteria itself. Um, exotoxins are what's released from bacteria, and they're either neurotoxins or enterotoxins, which is what causes the symptoms of the disease. Some of the examples of bacteria are anthrax, staph, spinal meningitis, and tuberculosis. Now, parasites are multi- and single-celled organisms that live off the host. They can only live for a short period of time on their own. They may have to find food. Some parasites are called helminths, which are basically pathogenic organisms. Examples of parasites are tapeworms, ticks, and um, the parasites that, that cause malaria. Infectious disease is the fifth most common cause of death in the United States. Okay, the, uh, uh, the development of this disease depends on several things. Okay, includes how viral the um, the pathogen is. Um, the, the amount of that pathogen that it takes to cause the disease, the resistance of the host, and the correct mode of entry. Okay, these things all rely on on a certain um, a certain chain of things to occur. All right. First of all. 
how do we how do we spread these things? Well, direct and indirect transmission. Direct transmission just means by like touching body fluids. Um, well, and actually um, by touching blood or body fluids, or uh, getting in contact directly with the source. It can also be through through airborne transmission droplets. Indirect transmission being by picking that particular pathogen up on an inanimate object. Um, that's why it's so important for us to, to maintain um, uh, infection control standards by keeping our equipment clean. Uh, you know, you may pick up a patient who has hepatitis uh, and it, you, end, you end up with that with that bug on a, a backboard and then you put a little 70 year old woman on that backboard and she picks it up that way. Smallpox was spread uh, through blankets that had um, blankets and sheets and, and uh, bedding that, that had the um, serum from the, the vesicles that the patients had. It was passed from person to person to person. Okay? Now, what determines the, the risk of infection? Okay, once again, uh, the type of exposure, how, how virulent the organism is. I mean, obviously, uh, if it only takes a, a little bit of the bug to catch it, okay, then it's highly viral. Um, also, the duration of the exposure. The longer you're exposed, okay, the worse it is. There are people that work with other people that have leprosy, okay, um, and it takes many, many years to catch it, okay, so it's not easy to catch, but it can be caught. And, of course, host resistance. You know, if you're if you're pretty healthy uh, and you have an intact immune system, you're more resistant. What's interesting is that uh, most people who work in EMS, since we're exposed to all the new bugs as they come along, we tend to have a really healthy immune system. Okay, so this this is pretty much the, the chain, all right? The elements of the chain. And the elements of the chain in order for, for the... Um, for you to pick this up is there they have to there has to be a pathogenic agent a, a reservoir a portal of exit an environment that's conducive to transmitting the, the bug a portal of entry into the new host and then susceptibility okay and even if all of those are actually present it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get it okay so the pathogen the bug all right these are organisms that can cause disease in a human host. They are classified according to their shape, their chemical composition, their growth requirements, and how, how viable they are. Okay, Pathogens rely on a host to support their nutritional needs. Okay, Now, some pathogens are actually equipped to survive outside a host. Okay, In contrast, like viruses, can only survive in human cells. Some viruses like HIV and hepatitis B virus can survive for several hours outside a host. Okay, and that's why blood products can be so infectious. Most bacteria are susceptible to certain drugs like antibiotics. Those drugs either kill the bacteria or they keep them from growing. But viruses are a lot more difficult to treat because once again, they, they have to be inside a cell for their life cycle and they become so intricately entwined in the host's DNA that it makes it almost impossible to kill. Okay? So the things that, that really affect a pathogen's ability to cause disease okay, include that it has to be able to invade and reproduce in a host okay, um, okay, the speed of reproduction. How fast it, it does this okay, uh, it, it, it's got to be able to produce this toxin and the degree of tissue damage that it causes hopefully won't kill the host. Okay, that's one of the, the main reasons that Ebola, which is such a hot, dangerous virus, doesn't cause a pandemic is because it does so much damage to the host that eventually it runs out of uh, 
it runs out of potential hosts. Okay. Uh, it has to be potent enough to reproduce quickly and in a, in a sufficient quantity to evade destruction by the host immune system. And it has to be able to outsmart the host's immune system while it replicates. Okay, it has to be able to evade an immune response in the host. The reservoir is the thing that, that harbors the pathogen. Pathogens can live and reproduce in humans or in animals. They may also live and reproduce in insects, uh, the soil, water, or food, or some other organic substance, or even a combination, or multiple reservoirs. Okay? When, when a person becomes infected, they may show signs of, of an actual illness. But also, a host may be uh, asymptomatic. Okay? They can actually pass that pathogen on to others without showing any signs of illness. The life cycle of this, this pathogen depends on three things. The demographics of the host, the genetic factors, and how effective therapeutic interventions are once that patient has an infection and seeks medical care. Now the portal, by, the portal of exit is how that pathogen leaves the reservoir and, and moves into another one. The method by which it leaves one host to invade another involves this portal. The portal from the host depends on the agent. It may be single or multiple. It may involve uh, gastrointestinal, uh, oral cavity, respiratory, an open sore, or a wound through which blood escapes. That period of time where that actively infectious pathogen escapes to produce disease in another host coincides with how long it's communicable. And that period varies significantly um, from basically from bug to bug. Okay. Now the portal of exit and portal of entry de uh, determine the mode of transmission. It may be direct or indirect. Hold on. So the, the portal of entry and portal of exit determine how it's going to be transmitted. It may be direct and direct. Direct is, is actually physical contact between the source and the victim. There can be oral transmission, transmission uh, through airborne droplets, fecal contamination, and sexual contact. Now, in indirect transmission, it survives on an animate or inanimate object for a period of time without human host. They can be transmitted indirectly by air, food, water, soil, biological matter. Okay? You know, they can also be transmitted uh, through like the handle on a shopping cart, okay, from from one person to the next. Now the portal of entry is just how the pathogen enters the new host. It can be injection, <laughs> injection, ingestion, inhalation, okay. It can also be through the mucous membrane and it can cross the placenta. The time it takes for the for the infectious process to start and that new host varies with the disease and how um, and how susceptible that, that person is. Diseases differ, okay, in, in how long that exposure has to be and how many germs are required to invade the new host, okay? And another thing, uh, which is pretty good, is that exposure to that agent doesn't always produce infection. And the reason it doesn't is because of the host's susceptibility. Now, whether or not someone actually gets a disease depends on a number of things. First of all, it's influenced by a, a person's immune response. It's also influenced by several other things. Okay, For example, uh, human characteristics, age, gender, ethnic group, and heredity. Okay? The, the age and, and uh, the age, you know, the very young and very old, Okay, are are going to be they're going to be more susceptible. Um, ethnic group, uh, a certain disease processes don't affect different ethnic groups. Uh, heredity, uh, you may have something in your immune system that, uh, for example, people who have uh, sickle cell don't get malaria. Okay, uh, general health status, 
if your general health status is is good, that means that your immune system is probably pretty good too. Uh, do you have a history of, of a disease that would make you more susceptible to some infectious disease? Also, what diseases do you have concurrently? Your immune status. Have you been exposed to this disease before, and do you have natural resistance to it? Um, also, possibly immunizations against the disease. Geographical environmental conditions. Uh, some bugs do better in the, uh, the summer than they do in the winter. Uh, cultural behaviors, eating habits, personal hygiene, and sexual behaviors. Uh, some of those really do affect how much easier it is for you to uh, pick up a bug. Now the human response to infection, you have you have a number of barriers and a, and a number of things in your body that are designed specifically to fight off an infection. Okay, you're you're going to be exposed to pathogens every single day, and even if you are, most people really don't get that many infectious diseases. These barriers basically act as your lines of defense against infection. The the first line of defense against infection is the surface of your skin. Okay. Uh, that includes the skin and the mucous membranes. These areas in your body, okay, are inhabited by uh, agents that produce disease uh, if it's allowed access to the interior of the body, okay? These are indigenous flora. The surface of your body forms a continuous closed barrier between your internal organs and the environment. Now, near, nearly the whole body surface is inhabited by microbial flora. It enhances the effectiveness of, of your surface barrier. Uh, and they do that by interfering with these pathogenic agents in several ways. Okay, first of all, they compete with the pathogen uh, pathogens for space and nutrients. They maintain a, a specific pH optimal for their own growth. And that pH can be pretty much incompatible with what that other, what those pathogenic agents require. Some flora also secrete germicidal substances, and the flora itself is thought to stimulate the immune system. It also pay, uh, it also plays a key role in the body's defense. Now, some indigenous flora can be pathogenic under certain conditions. For example, it can cause infection when the skin or the mucous membranes are interrupted. They can also cause infection when flora is displaced from their natural habitat to another area of the body. Uh, this is a common cause of urinary tract infections. Okay, after catheterization, um, you know, after a patient has a catheter. The, the first, your first line of defense is your skin. Okay, intact skin defends your body against infection. Um, it does this in two ways. First of all, it prevents the pathogen from getting through the skin. Second, it maintains an acidic pH that inhibits the growth of that bacteria. Okay, and also, you know, your skin sloughs off continuously, along with dead cells, oil and sweat, and, and oil and sweat, which kind of flush those microorganisms off your skin. Your GI system, there's normal bacteria in the gastrointestinal system, and it competes with co colonies microorganisms for nutrients in space. Normal bacteria helps prevent the growth of those pathogens. Also, stomach acid may destroy some of them. Um, it may also deactivate toxic byproducts of them, and the digestive system itself eliminates those pathogens through your poop. Now your upper respiratory tract it has sticky membranes, okay, the, the little cilia, okay, you have coarse nasal hairs and cilia that, that trap those foreign substances and it, you get rid of them by sneezing or by coughing, okay. They prevent those pathogens from reaching the lower respiratory tract. You also have lymph tissue in your tonsils and your adenoids that, that pretty much, um, it, uh, inspire a local immunological response and it's very rapid 
okay, to, to pathogens that enter the respiratory tract. Now, internal barriers are a little bit different, okay? Okay, internal barriers are a little bit different. Uh, they protect against germs when the external lines of, of, of defense begin to break down. And those internal barriers include the inflammatory response and the immune response, okay? The inflammatory response is a local reaction to cellular injury and that'll usually be in response to a microbial infection. When, when there is an infection, this line of defense is activated. It works to prevent further invasion by isolating, destroying, or neutralizing the microorganism. The inflammatory response itself is usually protective and beneficial. Sometimes it initiates destruction of the body's own tissue. It may be destructive if the response is sustained or directed against the host on antigen. Okay. The inflammatory response is usually divided into three separate stages. Uh, the first is the cellular response to the injury. The second is the vascular response. And the third, third is phag phagocytosis. Now, the, the cellular response uh, is what happens is the body mounts various types of cellular response to injury. And the processes that are responsible for the cellular injury are also pretty complex. Some cells are the targets of specific inflammatory mediators, for example, the leukotrains and histamine. When, when these cells are injured, the cell's metabolism is damaged. That leads to uh, decreasing reserves of ATP in the cell. When the energy reserves are depleted, uh, the sodium and potassium pump breaks down, and there's a buildup of sodium inside the cells, causes those cells to get, to, get uh, to swell up, along with increasing acidosis. That swelling further impairs the cell's ability to function. It leads to a breakdown of the cell's membranes. Eventually, the cell's lies, um, the, the cells uh, completely break down, and it stimulates inflammatory response in the tissue that surrounds it. Now, localized hyperemia, which is a, um, an increase in blood to the area, develops after those cells are injured. That causes edema. Leukocytes collect inside the vessels. They release that chemotactic factor, okay, which are chemicals, remember, that attract more leukocytes to that particular area. And those factors eventually migrate to the injured tissue. Now, phago phagocytosis is a little different. Through phagocytosis, leukocytes engulf, digest, and destroy the invading pathogens. They just eat them up. Circulating macrophages clear the area then of the dead cells and the other debris. The ingestion of, the, of that bacteria in the dead cells release chemicals that destroy the leukocytes. Now the first two lines against defense uh, or against infection use the same mechanism to respond to all pathogens, but the, the immune response is specific to individual pathogens. The immune system has has four unique characteristics. Number one, it has uh, the record it, the ability to recognize things that are foreign to the body, okay, and it usually responds only to those foreign antigens. Okay, number two, it produces antigen, antibodies that are antigen specific. Okay, which means that it can produce new antibodies in response to new antigens. Now, some of the antibody producing lymphocytes become memory cells. Those cells remember antigens that they have been exposed to, and they can mount a quicker uh, response to repeat invasions by those bugs that they recognize. And the, the fourth thing is the immune system is self-regulated. It activates only when a pathogen invades. Okay, that ability prevents healthy tissue from being destroyed. And yes, I know, there are autoimmune diseases uh, which occur because it's not regulating itself. Uh, patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, um, systemic lupus, the immune system uh, goes haywire. Okay. 
Now the body's immune response to invading pathogens depend partly on the size of the pathogen. Okay, it also depends on the pathogen's ability to produce an antibody. Okay, often the the peripheral phagocytic cells phagocytic cells encounter a pathogen first, but that you also have circulating B and T cells moving through your body at all times. And what they're doing is they're looking for pathogens. There's a comp complex interactions that occur among the neutrophils, the macrophages, and the B and T cells. These cells work with one another in processing antigens that can recognize and destroy pathogens that are invading. The B cell's role is to produce antibody immunity. Okay which is humoral immunity. This antibody coats the, the pathogen and facilitates phagocytosis. Antibodies can also fix complement. The complement system is a group of proteins that coat bacteria and help to kill them directly. Or the proteins can have the bacteria taken up by neutrophils or by macrophages in the tissue. T cells uh, not only produce process antigens for the B cells, but they also include a subpopulation of killer cells. Those cells play a huge part in cell-mediated immunity. Both the humoral and cell-mediated types of immunity take time to work. Both of them require previous exposure to mobilize specialized white cells in the body to destroy those pathogens. In time, those white cells differentiate between antibodies. Okay, They then Mount an attack. They mount an attack on the foreign material. By comparison, the complement system recognizes and kills invaders on first sight. Okay, it's like kill them all, let God sort it out. Okay, it doesn't take the time needed to mobilize special resources, specialized resources. Now, these are the stages of an infectious disease, all right? The progression from exposure to an infectious, uh, uh, from exposure to an infectious agent to the onset of disease follows specific stages. But the duration of each stage and the potential outcomes vary depending upon what kind of pathogen it is and um, individual factors, personal factors. These stages are the latent period, incubation period, communicability period, and the disease period. Okay. Now, latent period. The latent period starts when that pathogen invades the body. Okay. During that period, okay, uh, the infection has occurred, but the infectious agent can't be passed or shed to anyone else or cause clin clinically significant symptoms. Okay. Basically, the pathogen is just cooking. All right. Now, in terms of latent periods, boy, could may ever vary. Um, the flu has a twenty. It you can catch the flu in twenty four hours, and then there's HIV. Okay, and with HIV, you can go for twenty years before you don't have any symptoms. All right. The latent period is a stage. Uh, as a stage is distinct from a latent infection. A latent infection is an inactive infection that can still shed and produce symptoms. A latent disease is characterized by periods of inactivity before signs and symptoms appear between attacks. Herpes virus, okay, it's a pathogen that enters a readily enters a latent stage. Okay, during that stage, symptoms disappear. They reappear at a later time upon reactivation of the latent infection. Now, the incubation period, that's the interval between exposure uh, and the first onset of symptoms. Okay, like, like the, the latent period, this can vary in length. It can range from hours to 15 years or longer. During the incubation period, it reproduces in the host. The body stimulated to produce antibodies specific for that antigen. A person's blood may test positive for exposure to this, the disease. To the disease. There's a window phase that follows the infection. In that phase, the antigen is present, but there's no detectable antibody. A person's blood is tested for disease-specific antibodies in the window. They may test negative, even when that infection is present.
Now, the communicability period, that follows the latent period, all right? Uh, it lasts as long as the agent's present and can spread to other people. Clinically significant symptoms from that infection may show up in that period. Um, this stage actually is variable. It's often a major determining factor in how easy this particular bug is to pass from person to person. The communicability period and the method of transmission can be altered in some diseases. For example, uh, tuberculosis, syphilis, and gonorrhea. This depends on the stage of the disease and the primary site of the infection. The disease period follows the incubation period and it varies also depending upon the disease. Um, this stage may be free of symptoms or it may present, it may produce serious symptoms. And the symptoms can, can come directly from the invading organism or the body's response to it. During the disease period, the body may be able to rid itself of the disease entirely. On the other hand, it may become incorporated in the body and lie inactive inside certain cells. Okay, uh, for example, it becomes a latent disease. Several viruses, uh, most commonly HIV and hepatitis, lead to latent infections because you know the resolution of those symptoms doesn't mean that the that the particular pathogen is gone. Um, personal protective equipment is what, probably one of the best ways to prevent the spread of disease, and that includes gloves, masks, and goggles. It also includes gowns, but I, you know what? I don't think I've ever seen a paramedic wearing a gown. Okay? Now, the CDC says the most important means of preventing the spread of disease is 15 second hand washing. Uh, and that's probably a good philosophy, even, even after you take your gloves off, uh, even if you're wearing gloves when you take your gloves off, wash your hands. Now, obviously, when you're dealing with contaminated equipment, keep it clean or dispose, it, dispose of it in some manner that prevents indirect contamination to someone else. In 1987, the CDC uh, published guidelines for prevention of the spread of HIV that recommended that universal precautions, which was body fluid precautions, be extended and used for all patients regardless of their bloodborne infection status, because we don't know who's got what. Shortly thereafter, the Food and Drug Administration and the CDC identified which body fluids those precautions it should be applied to. Universal precautions for EMS personnel are superseded by an enhanced version we refer to as BSI, or body substance isolation, and it's based on the premise that all exposure to body fluids under any circumstances are potentially infectious. You know, better safe than sorry. Now these are, this section is on significant infectious diseases and I'm sure there are some diseases that are that are missing. Okay. HIV and AIDS. Um, AIDS is basically caused by the HIV virus. Okay. There are two types of, of HIV that are known, okay, HIV-1 and HIV-2, okay. Once that virus is inside a cell, the, the cell's genetic material is altered and the cell becomes part virus and part cell. The virus basically takes over the cell to make more viral particles. When enough of those particles have been produced, the host cell ruptures. This destroys the cell and releases that virus into the bloodstream to look for more cells. The cell receptor sought by HIV is a T cell. It has molecules called CD4 on its surface and therefore it's a CD4 T cell. When, a, when HIV attaches itself to that molecule it allows the virus to enter and affect the cell, damaging it in the process. The CD4 T cell count is used to determine how active the disease is. A very low count suggests severe disease. These molecules are also found on the surface of certain nerve cells. And monocytes and phagocytes, which probably carry the disease to other parts of the body. And even though the body develops antigen-specific antibodies to HIV, those antibodies don't protect the body against HIV. Normally, when someone is HIV positive, okay, it just means that they have been exposed 
to uh, the AIDS virus, or the HIV virus, I'm sorry, and uh, they have this virus in their body. Now, a positive test means that they're HIV positive, but it doesn't mean that they have AIDS. When a person is diagnosed with AIDS, it's because the, uh, they have developed opportunistic infections because of the uh, deterioration of their immune system. A lot of people who have HIV are, are HIV positive for 10 years or more, some of them 20. Okay, And what's happening in the meantime is that HIV virus is destroying the, the helper T cells in the immune system. Okay, Once an opportunistic infection gets them, then they are considered to have full-blown AIDS. Patients showing these opportunistic diseases are said to have AIDS-related complexes. The most common are PCP, which is uh, pneumocystic pneumonia, uh, CMV, or cytomegalovirus, which causes blindness, Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a form of cancer, Candida, which is a yeast infection in the mouth, and AIDS encephalopathy, which, which is swelling in the brain. They can also have a, what they call wasting syndrome, uh, sensory neuropathy, HIV dementia, which is also uh, AIDS encephalopathy, and toxoplasmosis of the central nervous system. This is a cytomegalovirus rash in a patient who has AIDS. Uh, this is Kaposi sarcoma, which is a form of cancer, and a candida, or yeast infection in the mouth. The, the, the two types of HIV, HIV, HIV 1 and 2, are, are both different in the bloodstream and geographically distinct. Um, HIV 1 is much more pathogenic than HIV 2. Most cases worldwide and in the United States are caused by HIV-1. HIV-2 is more restricted to West Africa. Um, sometimes when people have um, blood tests to test them for, for HIV, uh, they only screen for HIV-1. There are different classifications and categories um, of, the, um, of HIV, okay? Um, and it's all based on that CD4 T cell count. Okay, just remember, as the number of those CD4 T cells decrease, the risk and severity of the opportunistic illnesses increase. And like I said before, it can take anywhere from 10 to 20 years. Okay, 10 to 20 years. Okay, so um, hepatitis. There are uh, a bunch of different kinds of hepatitis, all right? Hepatitis is extremely viral. Uh, hepatitis A, uh, there are about 1,550 new cases a year, and it's usually caused by acute viral hepatitis A. Uh, it does not cause a chronic state, and it spread to person via saliva, food, or water that has fecal contaminants in it. Hepatitis A has a, an incubation period of 15 to 50 days. The average is about 30 days. Um, now, hepatitis B is the most common type of hepatitis. It has an incubation period of between 45 and 100 days, 180 days. The average is about 90 days, three months. Um, Communicability period of it occur, occurs during the incubation period, and it lasts through its clinical course. A, a, a patient may become a carrier for hepatitis B, and and may stay a carrier for, for many many years. Okay, hepatitis B is a hundred times more contagious than hepatitis A. There are about 50, uh, 18,000 new cases of hepatitis B every year. Seven hundred and eighty thousand people die of chronic hepatitis every year. Uh, it's spread by blood, blood products, semen, infected mothers pass it through their babies, tattooing, piercings, sharing razors and toothbrushes. It can also be caused by exposure to chemicals, toxins, alcohol, or acetaminophen. 
six to ten percent of patients who have hepatitis B develop chronic hepatitis, which is contagious. Uh, it can lead to cirrhosis, liver failure, liver cancer. 1.2 million people in the United States have hepatitis B. And 300 million people worldwide have hepatitis B. This is a patient who has ascites. And this other patient uh, that shows the, the jaundice from hepatitis B. Hepatitis C. Uh, there are approximately 16,500 new cases each year. It was initially called non-A or non-B because the, the causative agent for hepatitis C is, hasn't been identified. It's transmitted through shared needles among IV drug users, blood transfusions, hemodialysis, and needle sticks. 50 to 70 percent of people who have hepatitis C develop chronic infections that cause cirrhosis, liver failure, and liver cancer. 90 percent of trans, trans uh, fusion related hepatitis is caused by hepatitis C. The incubation period for hepatitis C is between two weeks and six months with the average being six to nine weeks. Uh, communicability it occurs one or more weeks before the onset of symptoms and indefinitely during chronic and carrier states. There is a carrier state of that. 3.2 million people in the United States have hepatitis C. Hepatitis D. Okay, there's uh, D, E, and G. All right. The most important of these three is hepatitis D, okay, or HDB, also known as the Delta virus. Um, this little virus only will will only survive in patients who have hepatitis C, uh, hepatitis B. Okay, so they have the, the patient has to have hepatitis B in order to get hepatitis D on top of it. Okay, HBV, hepatitis C, makes a surface antigen which is a protein that hepatitis D has to have that enables it to infect liver cells. It's transmitted by shared needles by drug users, contaminated blood, as well as sexual contact. Patients who have this with a uh, concomitant um, hepatitis C, hep I'm sorry, hepatitis B infection, they usually have rapid liver scarring and it's very difficult to treat them. You know, it's like having a, two cases of hepatitis B in the same person. Um, hepatitis E, which is called HEV. Hepatitis E mainly occurs in, in Asia where it's transmitted uh, oral fecal, mainly through dirty water. And hepatitis G, also known as GBV-C, uh, they kind of recently discovered it and they say it resembles hepatitis B but it also resembles the flaviviruses. Some investigators and researchers are challenging it that, that it may not be hepatitis at all. Okay, stay tuned on that one. We'll see what happens. There are immunizations for some types of hepatitis but none of them are 100% effective. Okay. Um, you have to remember that some patients are asymptomatic, but they have a carrier, but they're carriers of it. Signs and symptoms are nonspecific febrile illnesses, light colored stools, dark urine, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and tenderness, uh, jaundice, or they can actually have uh, um, fulminant acute hepatitis. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was once called um, consumption. It was once the leading cause of death in the United States. They had tuberculosis sanitariums all over the country. And it's caused by the bacteria, my mycobacterium tuberculosis. It usually attacks the respiratory system, but it can attack the kidney, the spine, and the brains. Okay. Uh, in, in 19... 98, there began to be kind of an upsurge in cases of drug-resistant tuberculosis, okay? 
um, and border cities and states that have high populations of immigrants have increased cases of drug resistant TB. 60% of all of those cases are in California, Texas, and Florida. Each year, 8 million new cases of tuberculosis occur worldwide, and about 3 million people die of the disease. Okay. Um, tuberculosis had declined in the United States continually since the turn of the century, but in 1985, that trend reversed, and they think that part of it was attributed to the epidemic of HIV, because the incidence of tuberculosis in HIV patients is 40 times higher among people that aren't infected with it. Um, other things include immigration of people from areas with a high prevalence of TB. Uh, there's, a, there's a high risk of, of transmission of it in places where there are, long, uh, where there are large uh, populations like homeless shelters or correctional facilities, even hospitals and nursing homes. And the, 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 there was an infrastructure that was primarily designed to take care of tuberculosis patients, and that has deteriorated, okay? And I think probably they're going to have to do something about it uh, to, to, get, to get on top of this again. Because once somebody's been diagnosed with this and they're put on the medication regime, it, the medication regime is very complicated and, it, and they may be on that medication for almost a year. Um, the pathophysiology of it is that it's acquired through inhalation, uh, uh, you know, through droplets, coughing, sneezing, or whatever. It also can be passed through contact with the sputum of the infected people, of, of an affected patient. People who share the same airspace as those with infectious TB are at the highest risk, obviously. Okay. Uh, the pathology of it is it's related to the production of these inflammatory lesions throughout the body. It's also related to the ability of this bacteria to break through the body's natural defenses. Okay, um, the, these tuberculosis causes chronic and debilitating lung disease, and susceptibility to that infection is higher in kids younger than three, in adults older than sixty-five, and people who are chronically ill, malnourished, immunosuppressed, okay, or immunocompromised. Okay, it may remain dormant for a long period of time. Okay, on, often not even causing uh, disease symptoms. But on the other hand, it may lead to active contagious disease. It, it is characterized by stages of an early infection, um, a latent period, and a potential for recurrent um, disease. Signs and symptoms are, are uh, hold on a second, um, uh, a cough, night sweats, weight loss, fatigue, uh, and hemoptysis. The organ systems that are affected by TB are uh, the cardiac system. It can cause uh, uh, pericardial effusions. Um, uh, cervical lymph nodes are usually uh, real swollen up. In the skeletal system, it can cause uh, disc deterioration and chronic arthritis. Um, and the central nervous system, it can cause subacute meningitis and brain granulomas. And then it, you can also get it in your bloodstream. Okay? In the United States, they estimate 10 to 15 million people have it. Um, approximately 10% of those people will develop it at some point during their lives. Okay? You need to have a high degree of suspicion for people who have undiagnosed lung disease, especially people who are HIV positive. Now, if you are given a, a, a TB time test and you end up with a positive test, it means that you have, um, you have the presence of antibodies. People with positive tests usually have to have a chest x-ray. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have TB. It just means that you've definitely been exposed to it. Okay. 
um, but also uh, also a <laughs> negative immune response doesn't preclude infection okay make sure that when you're taking care of these people okay uh, that you need to be aware of uh, the areas where you have active TB in your in your your particular region care for these folks is mainly supportive okay but you need to use a respiratory barrier for for you as well as the patient now surgical masks won't work okay that bacteria is too small okay um, they do reduce the number of droplets that are escaping for the patient so they need to be placed on the patient during transport they, they need the surgical mask on you you need a NIOSH recommends uh, recommended uh, particulate filter that respirator okay uh, also ambulance ventilation systems should include high efficiency particulate air filtration and a non-recirculating ventilation cycle. And of course you have to disinfect everything after you take care of it. Okay. Um, if, if treatment is started without delay, it's usually curable. Okay. But this multi multi-drug resistant TB is on the rise, and for that reason, a lot of people who have TB now are started on a lengthy four drug regime to treat it. Um, Okay, now, tetanus. Um, tetanus is a very serious, okay, potentially fatal disease. Okay, it's not, um, it is not, um, it's not contagious, all right? Um, it's caused by an infection of a wound by Clostridium tetani. Tetanus spores live mainly in soil and manure. Okay, but they're also found in the human intestine. And if, if the spores enter tissue, usually through a puncture wound or a burn, they multiply and produce a toxin that acts on the nerves that control muscular activity. Um, also, dead or necrotic tissue is a, is a favorable environment. It, it kind of likes that. There are about 500,000 cases of tetanus occur worldwide each year with a mortality rate of 45%. And, and these deaths often occur from wounds that are, are like minimal. Now, there's only about 100 cases of tetanus in the United States. Okay, the relatively low number of tetanus cases in the U.S. is a result of immunization with tetanus vaccines. The most common symptoms of, of tetanus is uh, trismus, which is stiffness of the, of the jaw, also known as locked jaw, because of the difficulty in opening the mouth. Uh, there's muscular tetany, um, painful muscular contractions in the neck, which move down to the trunk. Abdominal rigidity, which is often the first sign in, in pediatric patients. Uh, painful spasms or contortions of the face. And they, they, they call it ris, risus sardonicus, which produces this, this kind of grotesque looking smile. And respiratory failure. Treatment for these folks is mainly supportive. Uh, rabies. That's an acute viral infection of the nervous system. The disease mainly affects animals, but it can be transmitted from an infected animal to a human through virus-laden saliva. Okay, for example, by a bite or a scratch. Um, in the United States, wildlife rabies is common in, in skunk, raccoons, bats, foxes, dogs, wolves, jackals, and coyotes. Healthy wild animals are seldom seen. Um, a high degree of suspicion for rabies is indicated for all animals that are found outside their natural habitat. Hawaii is the only rabies-free state in the United States. Humans are really, really susceptible to this virus when, it's, when they're exposed to it. Uh, several things govern how bad the infection is, including the severity of the wound, the richness of the nerve and blood supply close to the wound, the distance of the wound from the central nervous system, and the degree of protection provided by clothing. The incubation period between a bite and the appearance of symptoms ranges from nine days to seven years. Nine days to seven years, okay? The initial symptoms include a low-grade fever, um, a headache, 
loss of appetite, hyperactivity, disorientation, and in some cases, actually seizures. Often they have an intense thirst, but they, but they can't drink because it causes violent, painful spasms in the throat, uh, which is one reason that they used to call it hydrophobia, which is fear of water. Eye and facial muscles become paralyzed as the disease progresses, and without medical intervention, the disease lasts two to six days, often resulting in death caused by respiratory depression. Kids' diseases. Kids' diseases. Okay, we have rubella. Rubella is a mild, febrile, highly contagious virus disease caused by the rubella virus. It's characterized by a diffuse, punctuate rash. The disease is transmitted by direct contact with secretions from the nose or droplet spray. It can also be passed transplacentally, okay, producing active infection in the baby. Also by contact with articles that are contaminated with stuff from the vesicles, blood, urine, and feces. Okay. Now, after they're infected, okay, the virus invades the lymph system, it enters the blood and produces an immune response. There's a rash that starts from the forehead to the face, to the torso, to the extremities. Um, in terms of the uh, communicability, um, it appears to be the first few days before uh, and five to seven days after the onset of the rash. Complications from the disease are rare, but sometimes young females develop a self-limiting arthritis. Now, congenital rubella syndrome affects approximately 90% of babies who are born to women who were infected with it during the first trimester of pregnancy. The disease is associated with multiple congenital problems, mental retardation, deafness, and increased risk of death from congenital heart disease and sepsis during the first six months of life. Infants with chronic, or I'm sorry, congenital rubella syndrome shed large numbers of the virus in their secretions. Okay, the CDC recommends that all healthcare providers get immunization against this if they're not immune to it. This helps re reduce the risk of exposure to themselves. Immunization is not recommended for pregnant women. Okay, and the once again the the um, incubation period is an average of 16 to 18 days. Okay. Now this is a little boy that has rubella. Now, rubiola, uh, uh, acute, highly contagious disease, highly communicable. The incubation phase on rubella is about, I'm sorry, rubiola, um, is about 10 days, all right? And it's infectious, I'm sorry, communicable, uh, a few days before the fever to five to seven days after the appearance of the rash. Okay, it's characterized by a fever, conjunctivitis, cough, uh, and a blotchy red rash. Virus can be found in the blood, urine, and pharyngeal secretions. It's usually passed directly or indirectly through contact with infected respiratory secretions. Okay. Rubiola can predispose a person to secondary bacterial complications like otitis media, pneumonia, and myocarditis. The most serious life-threatening complication is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. This is a slowly progressive neurological disease, and it's marked by a loss of mental capacity and muscle coordination. The symptoms that mark the onset of the disease include a high fever, nasal discharge, and encephalitis. Also, photophobia and a cough. Uh, one or two days before the rash starts, white spots are usually noted on the inside of the cheek. They call them coplex spots. The dermal rash is red and macular. It spreads from the forehead to the face, the neck, and torso, and eventually to the feet, usually by the third day. Uncomplicated cases of this usually last about six days. And the... Um, Usually, once they recover from it, they have lifelong immunity. 
months. Uh, the incubation period of mumps is two to three weeks. The average is about 18 days, and it's communicable um, for about six days before the swelling in their neck starts to nine days after. Okay, it's actually uh, easier to catch 48 hours after the, the swelling in the neck starts. Okay, mumps is um, char it's characterized by localized edema of one or more of the salivary glands, usually the parotid glands. It can affect both sides or only one side of the neck. In some cases, other glands might get involved with it. The virus invades and multiplies in that gland or the upper respiratory passages. The parotid testes and pancreas are the most frequently involved glands. When mumps occurs after the onset of puberty, it can cause painful inflammation of the testicles. But sterility is, is rare. That, that's, that used to be a myth. The intensity of symptoms varies. 30% of infections are asymptomatic, and immunity after recovery is lifelong. Uh, this is a little boy who has mumps. Chicken box, varicella. Uh, it is caused by the varicella zoster virus. Okay. Uh, virus is passed by direct and direct contact with droplets, mainly airborne. Uh, exposure to linen or, or uh, you know, sheets that have been tainted with uh, the vascular discharge uh, has been implicated as a way to get it. It is ex extremely contagious, okay? The incubation period is an average of about 13 to 17 days. Uh, communicability, it occurs one to two days before the onset of a rash and until the lesions have completely crusted over and not more day, not more than six days after those vesicles appear. Okay. Uh, it is, once again, highly communicable. It's characterized by the sudden onset of a low-grade fever, mild malaise, and a skin eruption that's macropapular. Uh, for a few hours and then vesicular for three to four days, leaving a scar, a granular scab. At first, the, the skin lesions appear on the trunk. Then they progress to the arms. The crops of skin eruptions each are associated with pretty severe itching, um, usually are more abundant on the covered areas of the body. The scalp, conjunctiva, upper respiratory tract can also be affected. The appearance of crops of vesicles like fresh vesicles that appear while other lesions are scabbed, is what differentiates chickenpox from smallpox. Okay, smallpox has vesicles that are the same age. Uh, they show up and they ripen at the same time. Treatment basically for chickenpox is symptomatic, and the disease itself is self-limiting. The complications from this include sometimes secondary bacterial infections, aseptic meningitis, mononucleosis, and Rye syndrome. Kids with chickenpox should be isolated from school, from medical offices, from emergency departments, and public places until all of those lesions are crusted up and dry. Now, after, after the primary symptoms are gone, the virus remains in the body in an asymptomatic latent stage. Sometimes they think what happens is it localizes in the dorsal root ganglia. It may reactivate during periods of stress uh, and cause shingles. The vesicles that are associated with shingles appear on the skin uh, supplied by the sensory nerves of a single group or an associated group of dorsal root ganglia. Now, unlike chickenpox, shingles isn't passed through respiratory droplets, but it can cause chickenpox in susceptible individuals who come in contact with open skin lesions. Um, it can also cause um, uh, Bell's palsy, okay? Now, some people will require more than one immunization to develop immunity to chickenpox. Okay, and th this little guy is starting to get it, or has gotten it. Now, if you'll notice, the, the vesicles here are different ages, okay? They're not all, uh, they're not all right. Uh, this is a, a 
patient who has shingles and a patient who has Bell's palsy. And you know the way you tell the difference between Bell's palsy and a stroke, okay, is that the symptomology, okay, or the stroke-like signs that they have only affect their face. Okay, they'll have good motion and grip and everything else. Just affects one side of the face. Influenza. This is, um, I think it's the, the thorn in our side, the biggest thorn in our side. Okay, it's usually just called the flu. Uh, influenza viruses are A, B, and C. It's spread by virus-infected droplets that are coughed or sneezed into the air. It usually occurs in small outbreaks or in every few years in epidemics. Uh, resistance is, is normally conferred after recovery, but this rest, re resistance is only to the specific strain or the variant of it. Okay? Signs and symptoms usually include chills, fever, muscle aches, loss of appetite, or fatigue. Those symptoms may be followed by upper respiratory infection and a cough that lasts for two days to a week. Patient management of, of, of patients who have the flu is usually um, supported. Severe cases, especially in the elderly and those who have heart disease, may result in a secondary infection with, uh, or pneumonia. Now, in 1918, there was a pandemic uh, that was caused by an avian flu that was literally catastrophic. It killed 20 to 40 million people worldwide between the uh, years 1918 and 1920. One fifth of the population, of the world population, was infected with this flu. Now, H5N1 is a type A flu that infects birds, and if the infected bird is eaten, the flu is passed on. This H5N1 virus mutated, and the virus jumped species and migrated to man. It's almost 100% fatal. Scientists fear that this will become the next pandemic flu. Okay, because of the way that it's acting. It affects people, it affects birds, it affects pigs, it affects tigers, and it, it continues to jump back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is kind of the one to keep an eye on, okay? Flu vaccines contain kill strains of type A and type B virus, okay? These vac vaccines, you know, may help to prevent infection. Uh, they also have... Um, um, a way of uh, administering that vaccine nasally, okay? Um, now, these these viruses have been uh, prepared for people between the age of 5 and 49 years old. But the problem is, is that immunity doesn't last very long. So the vaccine has to be repeated each year just before the start of the flu season. One of the things that's interesting is that they don't really know what kind of flu there's going to be that, that the next year is going to bring. And so they, they pretty much sat down and said, well, I think it's going to be a type A flu. Well, I think it's going to be a type B flu. And then they say, well, okay, all right, we've all decided it's going to be a type B flu. So they say, get your flu shots, because this is the kind of flu there's going to be. And then it turns out to be the type A flu. Okay. I'm just saying it's not exactly an exact science. Okay. The incubation period for the flu, okay, is 24 to 72 hours. <laughs> you don't have much chance of getting away from this one, okay? Um, now, mononucleosis. Mononucleosis, mononucleosis is, is often, <laughs> often referred to as mono, okay? It's caused either by the Epstein-Barr virus, or by uh, the cytomegalovirus, CMV. Both of those those are members of the herpes virus family. <clears throat> now, mono is spread from person to person by the oropharyngeal route and saliva, hence the name kissing disease. You can also get it from blood transfusions. Um, most people who have a healthy immune system are able to fend it off even after significant exposure.
Now, about 90% of the of people over the age of, of uh, 35 have antibodies to mononucleosis. This, this is probably because um, they may have been exposed to that and had a, like a mild childhood infection that was passed off as a common cold or flu. Previous infection like it generally confers a high degree of resistance to future exposure, but it, it can come back again. Now, signs and symptoms usually appear gradually. Um, there, there's a fever, sore throat, um, your nose begins to run, um, swollen lymph glands, especially in the, in the neck, and splenomegaly with abdominal tenderness. About 10% of the people who, who get it have a generalized rash or darkened areas in the mouth that resemble bruises. Okay, recovery usually occurs in a few weeks. Um, some people take months to regain their former level of energy. A uh, patient may, re may remain a carrier for several months, and at this point in time, there is no immunization available for mononucleosis. Um, the the drug resistant conditions, okay, MRSA, BRSA, and BRE. These are infectious, and some are contagious. Uh, bacterial infections caused by different pathogens that are basically called superbugs. Okay, although patients um, with suppressed immune systems are at high risk for any of them. Okay, does not does there is now a kind of MRSA called Community Associated MRSA, which is which is being found in healthy patients who haven't uh, who have not been in a hospital setting. Um, this is a patient who has MRSA, and I'm sorry I don't have anything on uh, the flesh eating disease uh, to show you. Now, sexually transmitted diseases. Now, the likelihood of you transporting a patient who has a sexually transmitted disease being their chief complaint, okay, is pretty slim. But caring for a patient with a sexually transmitted disease as a concurrent medical condition is good, okay? Therefore, remember your PPE, okay? There are more than 20 pathogens that have been uh, identified as belonging to this group of diseases, all right? including um, hepatitis C and HIV. The most common ones are syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and herpes. There have been reports recently about a real upsurge in both syphilis and gonorrhea. Now, syphilis is a systemic disease. It's characterized by a primary lesion, a secondary eruption involving the skin, and mucous membranes, these long latency periods, and late, seriously disabling lesions of the skin, bones, central nervous system, cardiovascular system. Okay. Um, after this particular bug gets in the body, the organisms travel within hours to the lymph nodes, and from there they're carried throughout the body. After the initial infection, syphilis follows a well-defined, well-defined stages of the disease. There is uh, no immunization against this, uh, and it's estimated that about 30% of exposures result in infection. There's a primary stage, secondary stage, and a latent period in syphilis. Um, within, within 10 days to 3 months of exposure, uh, a primary lesion or a canker develops where the, uh, the pathogen initially invaded. Okay. Um, it varies in size from one to two centimeters, and it usually single and painless, and it usually spontaneously heals within one to five weeks. During that time period, the, uh, the disease is really communicable. Secondary stage starts about two to ten weeks after that primary lesion shows up, and it lasts for about two to six weeks. That's where the patient begins to have systemic symptoms, which are a headache, um, anorexia, fever, sore throat, uh, swollen lymph glands, and ball spots in the area of infection. They also may develop a rash. Okay, it usually involves the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Okay, they may also have these areas of, of painless, wart-like symptoms. Okay, which are really infectious. 
um, the latent period follows that secondary stage, and it may show up any time from 1 to 40 years later. Um, it happens in about 25% of cases, and about 33% of these patients progress to what they call tertiary syphilis. Uh, it has symptoms. Um, they have, there's painful lesions on the skin. I'm sorry, painless lesions on the skin and painful lesions on bone. And the central nervous system, they get a spinal column degeneration, which is characterized by this uh, kind of ataxic gait. The loss of reflexes, pain and temperature sensation, meningitis, psychosis, and cardiovascular signs are dissecting aneurysms, myocardial insufficiency, which causes can cause aortic necrosis, uh, and cerebrovascular occlusions. Gonorrhea uh, is caused by the bacterium uh, Neisseriae gonorrhea. It's transmitted through fluid and pus from infected mucous membranes. It can also be spread from uh, a mother to her baby. Disease occurs in both men and women. What's interesting is that, that, that the, even though the disease occurs in both men and women, um, it differs in how it presents and its severity and in the ease of recognition. Okay, Now, gonorrhea is often treatable with antibiotics, but there's some strains in the U.S. that have been brought in by other countries that are really resistant to the usual antibiotic therapy. Um, antibodies develop after exposure, but the antibodies themselves are specific to the particular strain of gonorrhea that cause the infection. And then the problem is future, future reinfection with other strains can occur. Um, in in the male, okay, affected areas are the Cowper gland, the prostate gland, the seminal, seminal vesicles, and uh, the uh, epididymis. They, they can have a sudden onset of difficulty urinating, urgency, and frequency. And then they develop this discharge. Um, the infection itself can cause prostatitis, epididymitis, and seminal ves vesiculitis. Primary gonorrheal infections can also affect the throat, uh, the eyes, and, and the rectal area. Now, women, when they get it, um, the infection itself affects uh, the Bartholin glands, the skin glands, the urethra, the cervix, and the fallopian tubes. But more than 50% of the women who get infected by it are free of symptoms, so they don't even know they have it. Um, the disease itself can spread uh, can spread and cause endometriitis, salpingitis, and parametriitis, and also cause tubo ovarian abscesses. They can also end up sterile, and they have a, a much higher risk of ectopic pregnancies. Between uh, a 1 and 3 percent of these infections become disseminated in the blood, and they can cause septicemia, arthritis, endocarditis, meningitis, now, in the bacteremic stage, the patient may complain of fever, chills, and malaise. Chlamydia. Chlamydia is a major cause of sexually transmitted nonspecific urethritis or non-gonococcal uh, genital infection. It's the most commonly sexually transmitted disease in the United States. Approximately 25% of all men are carriers of chlamydia. It is the leading cause of preventable blindness in the United States. The signs and symptoms are similar to those of gonorrhea. This makes differentiation between the two of them difficult. In men, they may have a discharge. It can also cause complications such as swelling of the testes, which, if it's not treated, can lead to infertility. In women, it's usually um, asymptomatic. Okay. Um, the biggest problem is that if two partners end up with chlamydia and one of them is treated, they'll go ahead and, and pick it back up from their partner. And, and they may go back and forth and back and forth like that, you know, for a long time. Now, um, herpes. There are four herpes viruses that, that have been located. One of them is simplex. Okay, the others are cytomegaloviral, which is associated with mononucleosis, hepatitis, and severe systemic disease in patients who have a, a suppressed immune system. 
um, EBV, which causes, uh, or the Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mononucleosis, and varicella zoster virus, which causes chicken pox and shingles, okay? Uh, but I'm only going to talk to you real quick about the ones that cause sexually transmitted diseases, and these are the herpes simplex virus. There's two of them that are, that are really close together, and there's it's HSV-1 and HSV-2. Both of them can cause herpes infections, and both of them can cause infection anywhere in the body. HSV-1 is most often associated with herpes above the waist. Okay, uh, HSV-2 is generally associated with genital herpes. Okay, however, either one of those can cause disease in the genital area. Uh, HSV is common in the United States. It causes 300,000 to 500,000 new infections every year. It's estimated that 70 to 90 percent of all adults have antibodies against HSV-1. Uh, the mode of transmission for HSV is strictly skin-to-skin -skin contact. Virus centers through a break in the skin or through the mucous membranes. Okay, sexual contact is not required for transmission. For example, if you touch the herpes virus, uh, you end up with finger infection. Okay, many young kids who develop oral herpes probably contract the virus through a casual kiss from a parent or a relative. Okay, the virus can also be spread from other external body sites by auto inoculation. Okay, it, it may be spread like from lip to finger and then from finger to genitals. Okay, um, once present on tissue, the HSV produces an acute infection with tissue destruction limited to that one site. The primary infection usually produces some sort of blister. The lesion heals spontaneously from the outside in without lasting scarring, but the virus remains alive in the body despite circulating antibodies. Okay, after that first infection, HSV enters the central nervous system nearest to the site of the initial infection. It travels along sensory nerve pathways to the sensory nerve ganglion, and there it remains in a latent stage until it's reactivated. It can be uh, triggered by another infectious disease, uh, by menstruation, by emotional stress, trauma, or even immunosuppression. Okay, it reproduces a recurrent infectious disease state at that time, and it usually lasts only for about four to ten days. HSV can remain active for a really, or inactive for a long time. It's, it's kind of unknown why many infected people never develop the disease, whereas others experience a lifetime of periodic outbreaks. Scabies and lice. These are potential health hazards for all of us as health care providers. Both of them can transmit communicable skin disease and systemic illness, as well as dermatitis and discomfort. Okay? Lice are... Uh, scabies, okay, um, and all of these things are found worldwide, and they affect people of all races and social uh, classes. Okay? It's spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact between people, such as in hospitals, institutions, child care facilities, and nursing homes. There have been recent claims that they are also being spread through dressing rooms while trying on clothing at popular stores. Okay? Now, scabies are human, human scabies mites. Okay? Uh, it's a parasite, and it completes its entire life cycle in and on the skin of its host. A scabies infection resembles a lice infection. The scabies bites are generally concentrated around the hands and the feet, especially in the webs of the fingers and the toes. Other common infestation sites include the face and scalp of kids, the nipples in females, and the genitalia in males. The scabies mite uh, is usually passed by intimate contact or can be acquired from infested bedding, furniture, and clothing. A mite can burrow into the skin in two and a half minutes. Now, isn't that reassuring? Scabies is often manifested by severe nocturnal itching. Okay, but it usually takes about four to six weeks for sensitization to develop and for that itching to begin. The adult female is responsible for, for her symptoms. After she's impregnated, she burrows into the skin to lay her eggs. She remains in that burrow for a lifespan of about one month. Okay, although vesicles and papules form on the surface of the skin, they're often disguised by the results of scratching. In severe cases, Oozing, crusting, and secondary infection can 
that can result. Okay? People who've had previous exposures usually develop fewer mites on later exposures and experience symptoms earlier, usually within one to four days. Okay. Um, also, okay, so your signs and symptoms are going to be uh, pimple like irritations, burrows or rashes on the skin, intense itching, and sores on the body caused by scratching. Okay. Now, these body lice are a little different. Okay. They're small, wingless insects that are ectoparasites of birds and mammals. Most of them are host specific. Okay. Two of the species are, are human parasites. One is Pythyrus pubis, which is the pubic or crab louse, lice. The other one is Pedicula, uh, Pediculus humanus, which has two forms. Uh, a head louse and a body louse. Okay. The body lice, um, they were involved in outbreaks of epidemic typhus and trench fever in World War I. Lice themselves have a three-day life, uh, three three-stage life cycle. The eggs hatch in seven to ten days. The nymph stage lasts seven to thirteen days, and the egg to egg cycle lasts about three weeks. Lice, lice live, okay, uh, on blood from the host, and they have mouths that are modified for piercing and sucking. During biting and feeding, the secretions from the louse causes a small red macule and itching. Long infestation periods can result in a decrease in the itching, but but the skin will develop a thick, dry, scaly appearance. Um, if you become sensitized to them, inflammation can develop. Secondary inf uh, inflammation can also be caused by the scratching. This once again is, is spread by close-to-close -close person contact. Okay, these little, they look just like little tiny crabs. They move by crawling. They can't fly or hop. Isn't that reassuring? The eggs are often evident on, on the shafts of hairs. They're also sometimes seen in eyelashes, eyebrows, and axillary hairs. Pubic lice are usually acquired during sexual activity or from unchanged bedding in which the egg-infested pubic hairs have been shed. And although the primary bite lesions are seldom evident, the patient normally complains of intense itching. Okay, um, body lice are slightly larger than head lice, and they concentrate around the waist, the shoulders, the armpits, and the neck. Body lice and their little nits are usually found in in the seams of clothes and on the fibers of clothing. The lesions from their bites begin as small, little red spots, which quickly become wheels that resemble linear scratch marks. The treatment for all kinds of, of, of lice, okay, every type of lice is, is basically the same. Uh, this is scabies, and these are body lice. Ugh. Okay, the treatment for both of these, okay, is to use a, a uh, particular um, for example, uh, they have medication out there that's designed to eradicate them. Okay, the people are usually advised to wash all their clothing, their bedding, and personal articles thoroughly in hot water. <clears throat> They're also advised to wash the infected body area um, with their, their shampoo, like Quell uh, and Ur uh, uh, Urax or Rid or Nix. Okay, and um, these will kill 99% uh, of them, okay? Uh, in the old days, they, you know, when kids would come home from school and they had head lice, they would shave their heads. Okay, well, that's not necessary, okay? These medications would kill them, okay? Now, there was a recent study that was done in the United States, which encompassed 25 states, and it's shown that lice, lice have developed KDR, which is knockdown resistance to pyrethroids. And, and pyrethroids are, are the that's the most common uh, ingredient in head lice treatment. These lice are, are called mutant head lice, and although they don't carry disease, they're really annoying. Okay, prior to treatment, it might be necessary to determine if you're infested with KBR head lice. Okay, or if specifically if they've been 
located in your in your specific area, and and an effective treatment can be suggested. And and the the reason for that is that all of these medications that you, they use to treat these can be toxic. Okay, if if you use too much of them. Okay, uh, so you, you kind of need to know what you're dealing with before you attempt uh, before you attempt to to treat it. My, um, it's important also to really treat the environment, okay? Doctors recommend ensuring the cleanliness of the, the surroundings. So it means sheets, blankets, pillowcases, um, your bedding, all of that has to be cleaned really well. Clothing, um, washing hairbrushes and combs, and other personal items like hair accessories or even helmets and headphones. Also, vacuuming floors, furnitures, and rugs. Um, I, I also remember that there was a big deal in, in hotels that uh, they were they were turning up bed bugs. Okay, which I don't know if it's the same as as uh, scabies or lice, but it's something similar, I'm sure. Okay, Lyme disease. Um, Lyme disease. Um, is named after uh, Lyme, Connecticut, and they're finding uh, they're finding Lyme disease in a number of other places, but most of the cases now are in the north and northwest. It's caused by the uh, Borrelia burgdorferi and and spread by deer ticks. Um, in terms of Lyme disease, okay, there are actually uh, there are actually three different uh, stages of Lyme disease. Okay, uh, phase one. Okay, uh, this is where they have these large circular lesions. You can see the lesions here. Looks like a bullseye. Okay, um, a muscle and joint pain, fever, malaise, fatigue, swollen lymph nodes, headache, diffuse erythema, conjunctivitis, and periorbital edema. Phase two. Uh, this is weeks to months later. It uh, becomes very systemic. Pericarditis, myocarditis, AV conduction problems, meningioencephalitis, uh, as well as cranial and peripheral neuropathies. And phase three, okay, is, uh, it, you know, they won't progress to phase three if antibiotic treatment is started during phase one, okay? Um, Antibiotic treatment, once they determine, okay, what it is, uh, they can knock it down pretty quick. Now, all tick bites don't produce Lyme disease, and the tick usually doesn't cause infection unless they've been attached to your body for at least 30 hours, which means that if you go out and you go deer hunting or you're in an area where they have a high incidence of ticks, have somebody check you out. Untreated Lyme disease have serious consequences like arthritis, peripheral neuropathies, chronic fatigue, forgetfulness, poor memory, and weakness and paralysis in the facial muscles. Now, there, there's a, num a number of other infectious diseases or communicable diseases that we can talk about, um, but there are most of those, these really bad ones, okay, uh, are covered in the response to terrorism because they have the potential of being used as biological weapons. Um, but there there are two of them that I wanted to talk to you about real quick, and that's hantivirus and smallpox. Okay, Hantivir hantivirus is a potentially lethal strain of rhinovirus. rhinovirus. Rhinoviruses are responsible for common cold symptoms. But there are two strains that can cause uh, potentially fatal diseases. The diseases are hantavirus hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome and hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, which causes acute pulmonary failure. HFR, the pulmonary syndrome, has 38% mortality rate, which is a pretty lethal virus. Okay, Anthrax has a, has a kill rate of 20%. This is almost double that. There have been 683 reported cases in the United States. And uh, what's, inter what's interesting is that the United States is one of the few places where hantavirus is located. Now, the virus itself is spread through 
rodent droppings. Um, and if there's dust or dirt around the rodent droppings and the area is, is swept, it stirs this dust up, uh, and that appears to be the way that, that people get it. Hantavirus itself is not contagious. And the last one is smallpox. And the reason that I, I uh, went through smallpox here is because of the similarity in how it presents between chickenpox and smallpox. Okay. Um, this is also covered once again in um, response to terrorism. Uh, because it, this has such a, a great potential to be used as a biological weapon. Now, one confirmed case of smallpox is considered a public health emergency by the Centers for Disease Control. It was eradicated in, 19, in uh, 1980, but unfortunately, there are still places where uh, there are parts and pieces of smallpox and it's suspected of being resurrected for use in biological weapons, either by itself or engineered with other biologicals to, uh, to create a, a new and exciting biological weapon. Now, the CDC currently has enough vaccine to inoculate the entire population of the United States, but the bad news is that there are a lot of people who can't take the vaccine because of the awful side effects. There are two types of, of smallpox. Okay, there's variola major and variola minor. Variola major is the most common type of smallpox. It's highly viral and extremely contagious. It has a fatality rate of 30%, which makes it a highly lethal virus. There's a 7 to 14 day incubation period once you're infected. And if you manage to survive it, okay, a very long, painful recovery, if you recover. Uh, the second type is variola minor, which is much less fatal and easier to contain and treat. It's also less viral and less prevalent. Um, these are some kids who have smallpox. Now, smallpox starts, in a, in a, uh, starts on the face, uh, spreads to the upper extremities, then to the chest, then to the rest of the body. Um, all of the vesicles ripen up at the same time, okay? Miserable, miserable disease. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Now, people who have immune system complications, or they have a history of eczema or dermatitis, or even have pre-existing medical problems, can't receive smallpox. The, the smallpox vaccine. Many of the reactions that they can they, that they could have from smallpox are fatal. And this is a reaction in a, in a young child who had a smallpox vaccination. This was a, this was a reaction one week after he had his smallpox vaccination. Now the treatment for most patients with an infectious disease is number one, meticulous attention to personal protective equipment. Okay, preserve their vital functions, maintain airway breathing and circulation, uh, get an IV started on them, uh, possibly put them, put them on an ECG, and give them oxygen based on, on their SPO2 of 94 to 95 percent. Okay. Now, if the disease is respiratory, paramedic and their crew should use a uh, HEPA respirator or a, an N-type mask. Disposable gloves might even possibly want to double glove. Uh, washing hands, cleaning equipment, replacing expendables. And make sure once again if you dispose of contaminated material that can't be reasonably sanitized, um, dispose of it in such a way that it can't infect someone else. Exposure of a health care provider. If you or your partner are exposed to a communicable disease, communicable disease or you think you might have been, contact your immediate supervisor first. Now, if you have an infection control program in effect, okay, follow your particular protocols. But this is kind of the way that it's supposed to work. Um, 
if it's a probable exposure, it means that you have uh, gotten uh, you've gotten something on broken skin, or stuck yourself with a needle, or had some sort of splash in the, in the mucous membranes, particularly your, your eyes. That's a probable exposure. A possible exposure is um, an infectious organism on unbroken skin. Now, so if you feel like you've been exposed, okay, contact your immediate supervisor first. Your organization should have uh, an infection control officer or a company officer or whatever who's going to handle the incident for you, including immediate medical care and prophylaxis, a filing of an exposure report, and follow up with a medical facility where the patient was transported to. Now, when I say immediate medical care, that means that they need to fill out a workman's comp case on you. They need to fill out a first report of work injury and turn it into your workman's comp carrier. They will probably turn it down because most insurance companies refuse to acknowledge exposure to infectious diseases as an occupational hazard. Okay? Now, if you have been exposed and you're dropping the patient off in the hospital and you just stuck yourself with a needle, okay, they, they may have you stay right there okay, for immediate follow-up before you go back in service. Um, which means that you'll need to speak to the infection control officer at, at the hospital where you are. And a, a record of that exposure by law has to remain in your personnel file for 30 years. Okay, because remember, if you're exposed to something like hepatitis B or even HIV, okay, it could take a long time for you to show up, show uh, turn up with symptoms. Now, if the exposure is required to be filed with your local health department, a copy of that exposure record is going to be forwarded from the medical facility where that patient was treated. Now, the question is always uh, HIPAA, okay, and that is, are, are we violating anybody's right? Uh, anybody's right to privacy by following up like this. Well, HIPAA doesn't prevent you from gaining information regarding infectious diseases with patients. It is not a violation of their, pro uh, of their privacy. As a matter of fact, it's illegal and actually unlawful for any hospital or healthcare entity to withhold information on infectious disease from you as a healthcare provider. According to 45 CFR 160 and 164, the federal regulations uh, d delete the requirement for patient consent for disclosure of infectious diseases that have to be reported to the Public Health Service, the World Health Organization, and the CDC. Okay. However, you can only share that information with other healthcare entities. Okay. Uh, you have to preserve uh, their privacy okay, um, with, you know, from other people. Okay, that concludes infectious diseases. Uh, thank you, and goodbye.